Hello everyone and welcome to an introduction to Windows Virtual Desktop Spring Update. This is a repeat of a YouTube Live event I gave last week. Uh, that was based on a presentation I gave for the USA Windows Virtual Desktop user group uh, the week before that. The presentation for the user group was not recorded and the YouTube Live event had some issues with updating screens for some reason. So I'm recording this live so people can see all of the content. I worked kind of hard on some of these PowerPoints, so I want everybody to see them. I'm I am recording live, so you'll get all of the ums and ahs of a real live event. Okay. Um, I would like to point out, if you're not aware, uh, let's see here. There we go. I would like to point out, before I get started, if you're not aware of the Windows Virtual Desktop community, take a look. It's a great location for resources around Windows Virtual Desktop and the Windows Virtual Desktop community. <clears throat> and there are many user groups popping up around the globe. If there's a user group in your area, join it. If not, start one. It's exciting to see all of the activity on the product. Neil, Stefan, and Patrick are doing a great job with the Windows Virtual Desktop community and appreciate all the hard work they've put into it. The URL is wvdcommunity.com. With that, let's get started. I'll... All right, um, so I'm starting at the beginning with what is Windows Virtual Desktop. Windows Virtual Desktop is not a single technology. Uh, there were multiple technologies announced when it went GA, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. They include uh, the Windows Virtual Desktop Service, Windows 10 Multi-User, FS Logic, and MSI App Attach. These technologies can be used together to produce a, a remote desktop, to provide remote desktop connectivity to end users in Azure, or they can be used independently of each other. Many organizations currently use FS Logix and Citrix or RDS environments, for example. But let's start with Windows Virtual Desktop Service. Windows Virtual Desktop Service is used to publish remote desktops and applications into Azure. <clears throat> it replaced the infrastructure used to provide connectivity for remote desktop services. It's a free service, but you still have to pay for the underlying infrastructure services such as VMs and storage. If you've ever implemented remote desktop services, here's what you had to have to get this working. Um, you had to have a connection broker to manage connections, one or more uh, pools of session host for users to access. If you want to publish service externally, you need an RD gateway server that could run uh, RD web for the web client as well. You also need to configure a firewall DMZ settings for public access. If you want it to be highly available, you have to double everything along with load balancers and don't forget certificate management. I enjoy deploying and managing servers as much as anyone, but that's kind of excessive, especially if deployed in Azure where there's cost, asso cost associated with the resources. Windows Virtual Desktop Service is a PaaS service that replaces the functionality of the RD Web, RD Gateway, the Connection Broker, and the other supporting services such as certificates and load balancers in an RDS implementation. Notice that the host pools are not included. These VMs have to join a domain and are not part of the shared PaaS service. That's where the costs come in. Let's move on to Windows 10 Multi-User. Windows 10 Multi-User was announced with Windows Virtual Desktop. Windows 10 Multi-User is a huge advancement compared to how VDI and RDS handles remote, remote sessions. As the name implies, it's a version of Windows 10 that provides multiple user sessions. Until Windows 10 Multi-User, you had a choice of Windows Client Desktop, the, you had a choice of a Windows Client Desktop Experience with a one-to-one -one mapping between the VMs and the users in a persistent or non-persistent VDI offering, or a multi-session experience with a server OS. For those who've deployed RDS, you probably spent a lot of time configuring GPOs so the desktop and the start menu of the server OS matches that of the desktop experience. 
Windows 10 multi-user is a Windows 10 OS, so the, the uh, customizations used for desktops can more easily be used for the Windows 10 multi-user experience. Windows 10 multi-user can run independently of Windows Virtual Desktop. The image is available as a standalone VM deployment. A couple of things to know, there's an asterisk to this good news. Um, Windows 10 multi-user is only available in Azure. You could probably pull an image down and run it elsewhere, but it's not supported outside of Azure. Also, the OS reports as a server, so if you have SCCM collections based on OS type, that would need to be adjusted. Next is FS Logics. Users like to save things on their desktop, even if you tell them not to. How do I know this? Because I've been told not to store things on my desktop, and I store things on my desktop. It's never, in, it's never anything important until it disappears. FS Logic is a profile management tool that provides a, presentation, a persistent user experience across non-persistent desktops. FS Logic was purchased by Microsoft a couple years ago. It's now the recommended approach to profile management from Microsoft. It works by creating a container. This is not a Docker image, not that kind of container. It's a virtual hard drive that's mounted to the OS when the user logs in. The user profile is redirected to that container along with other user-specific user application settings, including settings from Microsoft Office. If you've supported VDI or RDS, you've probably battled Outlook at profile size issues. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with that. If you allow all email items to download, the profile directory fills up fast on the server, but if you don't cache the email locally, the user experience can be slow and suffer. The problem is worse with OneDrive. Uh, with FS Logic, the OST and the OneDrive cache are stored in that VHD on the network share, mounted when the user logs in and then disconnected when they log off, not taking up space on the local server. This is a pretty good option to have. And remember that this isn't Windows Virtual Desktop exclusive. You can use this with Citrix and Horizon for free with most Microsoft 365 licensing. To use FS Logic, you need a network location to store the profile containers. This can be a file server, Azure files, or Azure NetApp files. As long as it supports Windows NTF permissions, it'll work. Azure Files SMB support with Windows AD recently went GA. There's a support for Azure AD domain services with Azure Files as well. Both are good option for FS Logic profiles. Here's how it works. A session hosts have the FS Logic client installed. A GPO is used to indicate the location of the network share where the profiles are stored. When the user logs in, FS Logic checks for the profile share and checks the profile share and sees the container. If it finds a profile container, it mounts it uh, for the user to use. If the user logs out and logs back in and hits a different session host, the profile is mounted to that computer and the user has access to the same profile. And if a user logs in without a profile, FS Logic creates one and mounts it. Keep in mind that location matters with this. When a user interacts with their profile, the IOPS are not a simple disk read and write. The container is mounted to the local system over SMB not copied, so the profile access has to go over a network to the share, and then the reads and writes are take place at whatever the share is hosted on. The last item is MSIX App Attach. This is a similar concept to attaching profile containers to the OS, only with App Attach, the application exists as a container that attaches to the computer. Instead of installing the application on the computer, uh, this is this is a currently in preview. App Attach uses MSIX application files. Some applications are available as MSIX packages or they can be created. Once created, the application attaches to, to the computer for use, uh, avoiding the installation process. Let's look at a simple model of VDI or RDS. Uh, OS and, and the user profile and applications are all installed on a single disk. With App Attach and FS Logic, the application and profiles become portable, not dependent on the OS. The goal is to make the implementation less dependent on that OS, making it easier to recreate new servers without the overhead of deploying applications and rebuilding profiles. 
And did I mention that all these services are not dependent on each other? Windows Virtual Desktop Service can be used with Server 2012 R2, 2016, and 2019 if you want. Using a server OS to host the session requires a terminal server cal. If you use Windows 7 or Windows 10, uh, Windows 10 Enterprise or Windows 10 Multi-User Enterprise, no cal is required, but you do have to have enterprise licensing in place. Windows 10 Multi-User uh, can be used with other solutions. My Citrix knowledge is a little rusty, but from my understanding, you can put a cloud extender in Azure and use Windows 10 Multi-User as the target for the session. Uh, this is, there's also a partnership with VMware. FS Logic is a free tool, uh, most enterprise subscriptions. FS Logic is free with most enterprise subscriptions and not limited to Windows Virtual Desktop or Windows 10 Multi-User. Give it a try in Horizon or Citrix environments. I started this presentation quite a while ago and had to make some adjustments due to recent events. I'm happy to say that uh, an update to Windows Virtual Desktop recently went GA. It's referred to as Spring Update or Windows Virtual Desktop ARM. Azure does not have version numbers. Things just kind of get updated. Sir, uh, Spring 2020 was a big update though. Spring Update moves Windows Virtual Desktop from a standalone service with access to Azure to a full-fledged Azure ARM service. This allowed Microsoft to address some of the common complaints early on with the service. Two of the major ones were lack of portal integration, most management tasks had to be done with PowerShell, and the ability to grant Windows Virtual Desktop access based on groups. I'm going to focus on Spring Update for most of this, uh, the rest of this presentation. The improvements are significant enough that if you plan to deploy Windows Virtual Desktop, it'd be uh, best to test with a new version. If you have a previous version in place, you should probably start planning a migration. Before you start though, you need a few things put in place before you get started. The environment needs Active Directory domain services. I'm going to go over that next. Uh, but you also need Azure AD. Uh, this is important as well. It allows you to access the Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, you also need a VNet in place uh, to bridge the connection between the session host and your Active Directory domain. So if you can indulge me for a couple minutes, let's quickly recap three different directory services Microsoft has, uh, all of them with Active Directory in the name. Windows AD is a domain service that we all grew up on in the data center. This provides network-based authentication with Kerberos and NTLM and provides group policies and other user management tools. Azure AD is Azure Shared Directory Service used for cloud service management. This supports, uh, it, is, it supports web-based authentication such as SAML, OLAF, and OpenOD, OpenID. Azure AD Domain Services is like Windows AD, but offered as a PaaS service in Azure. It supports Kerberos and NTLM, but doesn't support things like extending the schema or domain and forest trust. This is important because Windows Virtual Desktop session hosts have to join a domain, either Windows AD or Azure AD Domain Services. And of course you need Azure AD in place to access Windows Virtual Desktop. What this means is you'll need some infrastructure in Azure prior to deploying Windows Virtual Desktop. The specifics will depend on your environment, but at a high level, if your session hosts need to join a domain, there has to be some networking in place to support the connectivity between the session host and Active Directory domain services, if that's Windows AD or Azure AD domain services. Let's review a few different options uh, for Active Directory networking. One of these will need to be in place before deploying Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, this is a configuration I use in my lab. The domain controller, in a, I have a domain controller in Azure and in my office, which is technically a utility closet, probably too close to a cat box. Uh, with the VPN, I've got a VPN connecting them. That could also be Express Route. You could simply deploy a domain controller, a Windows domain controller in Azure or leave the domain controller in your data center. Note that this would cause delays in processing logins and logins would fail if connectivity was lost. You could, you could also use Azure AD domain services instead of Windows AD. 
This removes the need to deploy and manage domain controllers. The important key, the important takeaway for this is that session hosts have to have connectivity to Windows AD domain controllers or Azure AD domain services during the deployment. If the session host can't connect and join the AD domain, the deployment will fail with a join domain error. Okay, let's do a demo. Um, I'm going to start this by uh, simply walking through a Windows Virtual Desktop deployment. So I'm going to come into Windows Virtual Desktop and click on Create Host Pool. A host pool is a group of session hosts or servers that accept user con connections. I'm going to give the uh, resource group, I'll create a new one. We'll call this WVD Demo 2RG. I've got to give a host pool name. Uh, we'll do WVD Demo 02 HP for host pool. The location, um, this is the lo location of the metadata service. Currently, there's only US locations. I'm going to select Central US. That uh, my understanding is that uh, the number of locations will expand here shortly. I'm going to leave validation environment no. Uh, validation environments will give Windows Virtual Desktops uh, Windows <laughs> validation environments will get Windows Virtual Desktop Service Fabric updates before non-validation environment. It's for testing. It kind of acts as an early warning uh, with Windows Virtual Desktop updates in your environment. And then the host pool type is going to be pooled, and I'll leave the load balancing algorithm as breadth first. And we'll come back to that here in a couple slides. Next, I'll go to VMs, and I do want to add VMs. These are going to be the actual session hosts that run. Uh, I'm going to leave it central US. I'm going to change the size. I like to use the B series for labs. Like this, uh, they just, they're cheaper. Probably not the best for actual uh, production though. I'll set the number of VMs to two. And the, uh, let's see here, the prefix. The prefix is, uh, is what the session host will be named. Uh, Windows Virtual Desktop will append a hyphen and a number after it. The image type is gallery. If you had your own image though, you could upload it to a storage blob and select it from there. I'm going to select the uh, uh, Enterprise 10 multi-user 1909 with the Microsoft apps. The OS disk type, I'll change that to standard hard drive. Again, for a lab environment, it just saves me, saves me a little money. Uh, I'm gonna select my virtual network. Now, if you don't see a virtual network here, Odds are you have to make sure that your virtual machine uh, location is set to the same location as your VNet. I'll set this to default. I'll leave public IP, security groups, uh, inbound ports uh, all as default. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to specify a domain and OU, but if you don't, it's just going to use this uh, uh, the UPN suffix for the domain join account as the domain it adds the servers to. So I'll give it a domain and I have to find the OU. Luckily I have that right here. I like to add my servers to a, sp to a specific OU uh, so they get all the group policies applied. I'm going to give it a domain join account. This is an account. This is an account with rights to add the servers to the domain. 
You could use a domain admin account. I created a, a specific account for just for this purpose. And then I'll enter in the password. Now it's important to make sure this is all accurate. If, if uh, something's mistyped or um, the password's wrong, the credentials don't have rights to add servers to the domain, uh, this deployment would fail with a join domain error. And that's a pretty common error that people run into. Next, I'll go to Workspace and I'm going to uh, add it to a workspace. I'll create a new one. There we go. And then you can add tags if you'd like. And we're going to come back to what a workspace is here in a couple more slides. And then I'm going to review and create. It takes a while for this to run, so I'm getting it out of the way, and then we'll come back to it once it's done. So the validation passed. I'm going to click Create, and we'll let that run. Okay, let's talk about load balancing. One of the items uh, we skipped past was load balancing. Load balancing is how sessions are distributed across available session hosts. With breadth first, with uh, the default is breadth first. This option distributes new connections across all available session hosts. A limit to the number of session hosts can be set but isn't required. The second option is depth first. This will fill up one computer to the maximum number of connections before sending new connections to the next uh, session host. This option requires a max user setting. Uh, new connections always get, new connections always go to the host with the most sessions until that host is full. So why is this important? Uh, I read someplace in the Microsoft documentation that Breath First offers the best user experience because sessions are distributed across all hosts. I'm not totally sold on that. If sized appropriately, depth first will offer good user experience. Users don't care if there are five or 15 active connections on a computer, they expect good performance. <clears throat> Here's another reason, how many organizations have a consistent number of users 24 seven? For most of you, demand goes up during business hours and then down outside of business hours. One of the value propositions of Azure and cloud services in general is that you only pay for services when they're in use. In Azure, VMs can be deallocated when they're not in use. But if the service is directing new sessions across all available VMs, how are those VMs going to be deallocated without impacting users? Microsoft has a script that will shut down VMs in both depth first and breadth first uh, 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 load balancing based on user connections by forcing log offs. This uses Azure Automation and Logic Apps to run and uh, was just released a couple weeks ago. I created my own script with the intention of being a little easier to implement. It uses Azure, it uses an Azure function to start and stop session hosts based on user count. It only works with depth first load balancing. It takes advantage of the way depth first consolidates client connections on the minimum number of machines. I have the code and a walkthrough video available on my website if anybody's interested. Let's go over how all these pieces fit together. If you've, uh, if you've used the original version of Windows Virtual Desktop, you may, have, you may be familiar with this. There's a tenant group that consists of tenants. Most organizations didn't use tenant groups unless you were an MSP working with multiple clients. The tenant was a container used, uh, uh, the tenant was a container that permissions could be set to. The tenant contained user uh, host pools uh, with session hosts inside of those. Uh, the VMs, a uh, session host is the VM that provides remote apps and remote applications. Remote apps and the desktop were contained within the application groups. Users were then assigned uh, rights to run the app, uh, access the application by the app groups. Okay, so this model is gone with a spring update. The organization is now much flatter. The functionality of the tenant groups is replaced by Azure Lighthouse. Uh, host pools still contain session hosts and application groups contain collections 
of remote app and remote desktop applications. Users are assigned uh, to an application group for access. There is one new item, the workspace. This is a logical grouping of application groups that users interact with. A user, uh, a user needs to be assigned rights to an application group and that application group must be added to a workspace for the application to be available to users. Here's how they all fit together. The host pool contains session hosts. Uh, those are the computers that users interact with. The application group uh, application groups are created and hosted by the host pool. Users or groups are assigned uh, permissions to the application group. Those applications are then added to a workspace and the user interacts with the workspace and those applications hosted on it. Okay, let's return to the demo. And that's still in progress, so I'm gonna come back. I've got another one that I deployed right before this this O1. First, we're gonna take some look, uh, look at the properties. So this is a brand new, um, bland, brand new deployment of Windows Virtual Desktop. And you'll notice a couple things. I've got uh, two session hosts and uh, one application group and one application. So let's go to properties. Here you can see we can change a, make a friendly name, change it to a validation environment. Um, we can add a max session number and change the load balancing algorithm. I'm going to come back to RDP properties here in a couple slides. Uh, we can go into application groups and when you deploy Windows Virtual Desktop, a uh, host pool in Windows Virtual Desktop, it also deploys a desktop application group. A desktop application group is an application group where users can inter interact with a full desktop. We also have session hosts. So these are the servers that host the connections. If you go into one of them, the important thing to remember with this is it's not act the actual virtual machine you're looking at here. It's the representation of the virtual machine in Windows Virtual Desktop. One of the things you can do in here is change the uh, uh, drain mode. So what that will do is it's like a maintenance mode. It prevents new connections, but doesn't kick people off existing sessions. Oh, let's get back there. And then application groups. Uh, I think I went over that already. Okay. Uh, one of the things we do have to do with this application group though is um, there's no assignments. So I'm going to add an assignment. This is gonna give a group or a user rights to access this. So what I can do is I've got a group called Windows Virtual Desktop Users. Uh, that's sourced from Windows AD. I can select that. And this is what you couldn't do with the previous version. Uh, now I just added a group uh, to that application group for access. So that's the full desktop, but what if we want to um, create what if we want to create a remote app uh, application group? I'm going into application groups and I'm going to click add. And I'll select the same um, resource group that this deployment went to. So it's got the host pool 01, which is the one I deployed before this. Uh, notice that I only have the application group type of remote app. We can have multiple remote app application groups, but we can only have one desktop application group per host pool. I'm gonna give this a name. Uh, WVD Demo 01 AG for application group. And I'm going to add the user. Uh, actually group. So this is the assignments. I'll give that same group access. Now we go to applications. I'm going to add an application quick. And you can either do start menu where it looks at the items in the session host start menu and adds that, or you can do a file path. I'll leave it at start menu. I'm going to deploy WordPad and click save. 
So this application group will publish WordPad. You can add more applications if you like. I do want to add it to a workspace, and if I select that, it only gives me one option. So a host pool can also only publish application groups to one workspace. Because there's already a, a remote desktop, or I'm sorry, a, a desktop type application group hosted on the uh, WV De Demo 01 workspace, that's the only option for this application group. I'll go to tags and review and create. And create. And while that's finishing, I'm gonna hop back to the presentation. We're gonna talk about client settings. So with remote with the remote desktop client, you're able to publish an RDB, RDP file uh, with configuration settings. Uh, in RDS, you could control client settings through the connection broker. Unfortunately, the old RDP client, uh, MSTSC, will not work with Windows Virtual Desktop and there's no connection broker. Instead, you can set the client settings at the host pool. I wanna show you how to configure these settings, but more importantly is where to find them. Uh, the link on the screen is a list of supported RDP settings for Windows Virtual Desktop. So let's go over back to that. So here it is, and notice that uh, we've got the RDP settings, description of values, uh, uh, valid values, and the default value, as well as if it's supported in Windows Virtual Desktop. So you can see the first few here are no, but if we go down, we start to see that uh, 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 disable connection sharing, alternate shell. So we, now we can see that some of them, uh, the ones that are supported. What I wanna do is find um, one of the more popular ones, which is uh, clipboard redirection. So here is redirect clipboard, and then uh, it shows the value gives a description and the default value is one, meaning it allows uh, clipboard redirection. And it is, here it shows it is a, uh, a value you can use with Windows Virtual Desktop. <clears throat> so I'm gonna copy this. We'll come back to our host pools. We'll pick that host pool uh, demo 01, go into the properties. And down here under RDP properties, I can add that in. And notice it gives you an example and notice that multiple values can be added separated by semicolon. So for example, you might wanna do this as well as like um, disable printer redirection or USB redirection. So I'll click save. Okay, so now that we have the applications and remote desktop, uh, we, have a, we have a published remote app, we have a published uh, desktop, we've changed some settings. Uh, let's see how users access them. So there's two available clients, or well, multiple, but there's a web client. Uh, this is an HTML5 capable, any HTML5 capable web client can use this URL. Or there's also a, remote desktop client for Mac, Windows, Android, and iOS. Let's go back and try logging in. I'm gonna open up a new incognito window. I'm gonna to go to that link. And do note that this is a different link for Windows Virtual Desktop Spring Update. Uh, it, it's an updated link. It's not the same link as the uh, fall 2019 or the original GA version. I'm going to log in. Try to log in. And there I have my default desktop and WordPad. So if I click on the default desktop, it's gonna ask me to log in again.
The first login was to log into uh, Azure AD into the Windows Virtual Desktop Service. This is a domain login that I'm running now. So it's logging me into the actual domain on that computer. And I know that uh, single sign-on for that has come up a couple times. You can cache credentials. Uh, I'm using an incognito window, so you can't do that. Uh, but here it is, this is the remote desktop. So everything is working just like it should. I'm actually gonna log off. We'll close out. Next, I'm going to open up the uh, Windows application. Let me just... Okay, I'm gonna unsubscribe so we can start from the beginning. So there's two options. With the Windows client, you can subscribe and that will take you through the login pro process to Windows um, in with Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, that's only available with the Windows client. The last time I checked the other, the iOS, Mac, and Android client, it didn't have that option. They had subscribe with URL. Now there's a URL, there's a feed URL you can add, um, which is different from the web client URL. And if I add that in, um, it works, it finds it. It's the same URL for everybody. But that's kind of cumbersome to, um, to share with end users. If you had people working remote on Macs or Android devices or whatever, uh, it would be kind of difficult to get them to share that with them. So instead, what you can do is use something called email discovery which uh, you basically add a value and a record in your text record DNS, uh, your external DNS text record, uh, the, the record is underscore MSRADC and the text value is the feed URL. I have a video on this uh, if you need more information. But basically what it does is when a user en enters their email address, uh, that autom automatically discovers that feed. Now, if I click yes, there it is. So now I can double click on WordPad and we can open up a remote application. Here you can see it cached some of my credentials. There it is. So it opened up just like it's running local. Okay. Uh, so uh, what did we go over? We went over the basics of Windows Virtual Desktop. Next, we covered the requirements to deploy Windows Virtual Desktop. We went through deploying and configuring Windows de uh, Virtual Desktop, including creating a remote application. And after that, we logged in with a web client and the Windows client. Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, hopefully this makes it out in a higher quality than the uh, live event I did earlier this week. Uh, thank you for watching.